the name of the sermon, Through Hell to Glory, and it's based on our text, Psalm 22. Let's pray together. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our strength, our rock, and our deliverer. We glorify you through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The final week of Jesus' earthly ministry is called Passion Week, and passion there means suffering. This talks about the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. It describes the opposition that he had in the temple and the difficulty he had even at his final supper with the disciples, knowing that one of them would betray him and they would all abandon him. As he labored in prayer, suffering in the garden as realizing full well what he would do in bearing the sins of the world. And he even said, if there's another way, may this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then there's the arrest and the trials and the beatings and more trials and more beatings and finally going down the way of sorrow to the place of the cross, the execution at Golgotha. And there he was crucified. He was put on a cross to remain there till he was dead. And he died. It's a hard part of the gospel to read, but it's an important part. There is no other week of Jesus' ministry that has more chapters devoted to it. This is the important part. And yet the text I have for our hearts to meditate on is none of those chapters from the gospel, but a psalm, a psalm written about a thousand years before Jesus was born. It's a messianic psalm. It's not a messianic psalm the way some of the others are. The others talk about God's anointed, God's Christ, God's Messiah. It talks about his rule and his reign and the enemies fleeing before him. This speaks of his suffering, of his great suffering. And it describes in shocking detail events that happened around the cross. For example, Matthew 27, we read about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying in Hebrew, Eli, Eli, laba sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are the first words of the psalm. Why did Jesus utter these words? And with such a loud voice. Often I think it's misunderstood. It was misunderstood by some of the people who heard him, who heard this Eli, Eli, something or other, and thought maybe he's calling for Elijah. Or maybe God would hear and would send Elijah to come. Let's see if it happens. They didn't fully understand. Even still, there's misunderstanding that perhaps at this point, God abandoned his son or forsook his son. But even that psalm goes clearer to say that that's not indeed what happens. This is the beloved son. At his baptism, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. At the transfiguration, he is still the beloved son. Or perhaps because he now takes upon himself the sin of the world and now needs to bear that and the judgment of God that there's a sense of God turning his back on his son. If only... Because Christ, who knew no sin, took the sin of the world upon him, God faced forward in full judgment. You know in the book of Revelation there are those who anticipate the judgment of God and say, rocks fall on us, mountains cover us over, hide us from the wrath of God. There was no hiding from the wrath of God. 
for Christ who took the sins of the world upon him. Yes, I suppose abandonment would be easier than to suffer the wrath and judgment for the sins of the world. When I entitled this Through Hell to Glory, I was not just being dramatic. The suffering that he had was not physical only, even though the physical was excruciating and difficult to comprehend. There was something far more. He carries on himself the weight of our sin. What is he saying then? He's quoting this psalm, the first words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry by day, you do not answer. By night, I find no rest. Jesus begins this psalm so that those who look on the crucifixion will understand in a new light. Because this psalm explains what's going on beyond what even can be seen. Did they understand it at the time? No. Can we from this distance? And the answer is yes. I think we can understand it a little better. But we need to understand that this is not just the time of Christ paying the penalty to turn away the wrath of God. This is also the time where we see God's love and glory, even in this gruesome scene. Psalm was written by King David. We don't know what events may be in his life that would have prompted him to write this, but we also know that he was a prophet and was writing the word of God and As writing the word of God, he was talking about something that was beyond him. Here, David's descendant and heir would hang on the cross. Like in the other Psalms, you can use them to cry out to God for help in your time of affliction. Have you ever felt really afflicted? Yes. We cry out to the Lord. But in the great suffering, we don't abandon our faith, we even cling to the Lord more. Even if the Lord seems silent, we cry out to God, following Christ's example, because in Christ, God is our Father as well. This psalm answers the cry of the heart that feels forsaken. And it's interesting because it reminds that heart of times in the past when God has answered. Verse 3, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Now this is not saying God was faithful to them, but not to me. This is not saying, well, God was faithful to David or Jesus, but I don't know about me. No, this is saying God is faithful to his people of whom I am one. You belong to the Lord. You're part of the people of God. This is your call to remember that he delivers us. Every time you hear of God delivering, does not your heart raise in praise? Or is your faith not encouraged? You hear of someone else And you remember times when God has delivered you, rescued you. Don't forget the mercies and the kindness of God. Recall them to your lips, even in times of great difficulty. In fact, if you have them on your lips often, you'll recognize that kindness even in the times of difficulty. Deliverance hadn't come yet to the psalmist. Verse 6 says, I am a worm and not a man scorned by mankind and despised by the people. We began the service with a hymn by Isaac Watts. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head to such a worm as I? There have been hymn books that I think, well, that's, that's kind of low on the ego. Maybe we need to change that, something else. They talk about worm theology. Well, I'm not a worm. 
Oh, dear ones, we missed the point. Why did Isaac Watts use that language? It's because of this psalm. It's because of the Lord Jesus who is placed in that place of helplessness like a worm because we were helpless. Indeed, we are helpless. And the distance between you and a worm is much closer than the distance between you and the Almighty Creator. We are indeed low. Christ became low and powerless to save you. Praise the Lord. Much of this psalm prophetically mirrors and talks about what happens around the cross. Verse 7, all those who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Well, you've read in the Gospels, this is exactly what they said. If you're really the son of God, come on down. Well, if God really is on your side, he'll do something. Even the thief on the cross, yeah, come off the cross and save us too. And they hurled these jeers at him. Jesus didn't take the bait. Jesus looked full into the horror and the abyss of what he would suffer in judgment on the cross. And he didn't shrink back from drinking that cup to the end. He certainly isn't going to be deterred by some people wagging their tongues and mocking. By the way, so it should be. Realize that people, they're not your God. God is great. People, not so much. God is powerful. God is big. When God is big, you're not going to worry so much about what they say. Remember, it's God who cares for you and he has not forsaken you. Verse 9, yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Let this truth be rooted in your heart when you have difficulty and trial. You need this. It was rooted in Christ's heart, even on the cross. He knew this. Keeps you, to look, keeps you looking to the Lord. Keeps you crying out to the Lord. Verse 11, be not far from me. Trouble is near and there is none to help. Well, there is none to help except the Lord who is our help. And he is the one we need. And these next verses, as I've already said, they, are, they mirror what was around with Jesus. They, the enemy is described as this menagerie of dangerous animals. There's lions and, and bulls and dogs and they're, they're, they're goring and they're barking and they're, they're clawing with their teeth. And Jesus is described being surrounded by these enemies. A lion with teeth that devour. Rome was like a lion. And it devoured countries. We see the, down verse 16, we see the reference to the dogs. Well, the Gentiles were often referred to as dogs. And so were these mockers. Many bulls encompass me, verse 12. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravishing a lion, a roaring lion. And then this description in verse 14. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. Jesus had been sapped of strength before he ever got to the cross. You remember that after all that he endured, he took that final way, the way of, of, of pain and sorrow, through Jerusalem, carrying the cross beam to the point where he stumbled and couldn't get up. They got Simon, who was in from the country, he's from Cyrene, and they put it on him, said, you carry this. He followed behind, and Jesus went up. Then, after he was there, they, they nailed him to that, and took the cross, and put it up, and set it into the hole that would keep it upright so he'd be visible. You can imagine as it hits into the bottom all of his bones being jerked and muscles jerked and even bones jerked out of place. 
and the whole trial of crucifixion is such that it brings a raging thirst. And Jesus cries out, I'm thirsty. What does the psalm say? Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. And they, you lay me in the dust of death. Even the description of the nailing to the cross is here in verse 16 and 17. For dogs encompass me, evildoers encircle me. They pierced my hands and my feet, and I can count all my bones as they stare and gloat over me. The Roman execution squad would take the last property of the doomed man, as well as his dignity, by taking away his clothes. And they figure, well, who gets what? Well, we'll draw straws. We'll cast lots. And you know that's what happened. And even the psalm describes this. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Of all the verses, that seems the most prophetic, perhaps, although it's hard to pick. This is the psalm that goes with the crucifixion, just as Psalm 118 goes with Palm Sunday, because that's the psalm they were all singing and chanting when Jesus came in just a few days before. Now those 21 verses, maybe, uh, maybe 22, are generally what we think of. If you look in the back, that's about how far it goes in our Psalter. We sang Psalm 22, those many verses, but there are more. Let's hear the rest, though. Verse 19. You, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Even though it's desperate, he still cries out to the Lord with confidence. Have confidence in the Lord. To whom else can you cry? How about the book of Job? Job was suffering. Job knew that the suffering he had was under God's control. He said, I've got to listen. I've got to, to, to say to somebody, who am I going to talk to? God's the only one that can do anything. Even if God's the one who's arranged this. So I'm going to cry out to him anyway. He doesn't blame the Lord. He cries out to the Lord. But the psalm doesn't end here. It has a very positive ending. Christ does endure the wrath of God that comes against us because of his sin that he received from us. Again, Christ who knew no sin became sin for us. That judgment was our judgment that he took to turn away the wrath of God. But there's more here. Because here in this psalm, we also read of the glory that comes afterwards. We hear of the vindication that God has. Because the cross is not just about pain and judgment. The cross is also about the mercy of God and redemption. It's victory. Even more than the miraculous or amazing description of the crucifixion that we see in this psalm, the reason that we look to it is because Jesus is the one that tells us to look at the crucifixion with this psalm in mind. That's why he begins the first line, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jewish uh, ways of teaching and some of their, their techniques, they have what's called remez, which is where they would just give a hint and then everyone would know what passage they're talking about. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Just to love the Lord with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength. Or if I was going through great difficulty and you said to me, how are you going? And I would say, the Lord is my shepherd. You'd know what I was talking about because you know that psalm. You would immediately hear it. Well, here he is saying this psalm for us to look at. Going through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, that's certainly here as well. 
when we hear this, we realize that this is for us. So we have an advantage of seeing all of this in understanding. So let's not stop at verse 22, but to the end. Because this doesn't end in death, this ends in vindication and rejoicing and praise. Verse 22 says this, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, you offspring of Israel. The end is not the end. The end is to the great praise of God. We see Jesus saying, I'm going to be in the midst of the congregation and I'm going to praise the Lord and direct others to praise the Lord. So we see not just the death which brings us life, but we also see the love of God that's going through that that brings Jesus back. God has a plan through this that the world considers foolishness. But as Paul reminds us, the foolishness, the the wisdom of, of man is but foolishness. The foolishness of God is wiser than the wisest things of man. God restores Jesus. Verse 24 He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard. When he cried to him, Christ goes through the valley which we could not endure or even comprehend, and God vindicates him to the place of glory. So when you consider the cross, remember, the empty tomb is coming. It's Friday. Sunday's coming. Verse 25, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek him will praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. And now see even how the The people of God will expand. This event brings an explosion of the people of God as the gospel goes out. Verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. This psalm speaks of the eternal nature of this victory. Because this isn't just for one generation, this is for all generations. Verse 30, posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generations. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. And this, indeed, is the result of the cross. We hear, we believe, generations have heard and believe, and we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, generation after generation. The cross of Christ, Christ on the cross, died to atone for our sin, and that's the victory that we see. Jesus wanted his followers to remember and understand what's going on. This is where our sin is removed. We're reconciled to God through Christ. But he also wants to remind us where this psalm ends, because it ends with glory. So how do we view the cross of Christ? Good Friday, we focus especially on the cross of Jesus. We should view it soberly, somberly. This is, as many of our hymns that we've sung and things that we've said, it is horrible in many ways. The cruelty of the cross is made more cruel because of the one to whom it is given, the one who brought love and life, the creator. And the creator in Christ dies for man the creature's sin. How can that be? How should we respond? We contemplate the enormity of what's happening, but it also brings something else. You should consider it and be satisfied. 
You should consider it, consider it, and give praise. You should consider it and know your hearts now live forever because you're in Christ. You praise our Lord and King because it pleased God to lay on him our sin so that we could be reconciled and bear it no more. And Christ will rise triumphant. And Christ has risen triumphant. And so will you, as you trust in him. Let's pray. Almighty God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through his teaching, through his life, you've shown us the true way. And you've shown us in his suffering and his death that the path of duty and obedience may lead to the cross and the reward of faithfulness may be a crown of thorns. Give us grace to learn those lessons as well. We take up our cross and follow Christ. That's what he's told us to do. May we do so in strength and patience, even as he did. Give us such fellowship with Jesus in his sorrow that we would know the secret of his strength and his peace. Even when we have difficult times, shine your eternal light. O oh Lord, you alone can order all the unruly thoughts that we have for sinful people. Grant to us, your people, that we would love the things that you love. And love the things that you command. And among all the changes that we have, our hearts would be fixed on you and your joys. And Lord, even as we have prayed, may your Holy Spirit be with us anew. Sanctify us. Visit us here with your love and your favor. Give us light to our minds and our hearts with true and everlasting truth in Christ. Graft it in there. Increase in us the true faith. Keep us in your mercy. Oh Lord, grant that we would be faithful in love and in our worship and serve you here in this life, ever looking toward the eternal life that we have with our Savior who died for us and rose again.